Let's uh, let's open the, the Bible together this morning. It is still morning, I hope. We haven't gone too long yet. That cannot be the right time. Let's go here anyways. We're going to spend a lot of time in Thessalonians in the New Testament, but I wanted to start off in the book of Acts for just a moment. Because when we look at Scripture, and we look at the end times or the last days or the, all these kind of things happening, we need to be reminded that, uh, let's say a third of our Bible there, you know, maybe somewhere in there, about 30% of your Bible is prophecy, and the majority of prophecy speaks about the end times, the last days, and so you're naturally going to, as you're just reading through Scripture, doing your devotions, you're naturally going to keep encountering end times. You're going to keep bumping into words about the end times. So when we speak of the you know, correct terminology is eschatology, when we speak about end times or last days, we're talking about the kingdom of God that is already at hand, but not yet. Because we're reading about the not yet that's going to come, but we're talking about it's already happened, it's already been written about, it just needs to be fulfilled. And so for those that believe that, that's actually, that's good news. Because we're not quite like, oh, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Like I gave my life to the Lord, and I don't know what's going to happen next. It's very clear in Scripture, the things that will come to pass. Because we know that Jesus is coming back at some point very, very soon. And when we think about the eschatological events in Scripture, so we'll look at some terms here, some words. Uh, so like the Last Supper we've heard about, or the Wedding Supper, the Judgment Seat of Christ. Who is that for? Tribulation, Antichrist, uh, False Prophet and the Dragon, which creates Antichrist, False Prophet and the Dragon. That creates a, an ungodly triune Godhead. Uh, the Mark of the Beast, Armageddon, the Millennium, of, you know, Thousand Years. A white throne judgment, new heaven, new earth, like all of those words you're going to interact with and encounter in the scriptures. I want to spend some time today, though, talking about the rapture. Because we're under the gun, as always. We don't have enough time. I would probably need about five or six hours to go through all those, and that would be a lot of fun. You would have a great time, right? Maybe we'll do a series on that one day. <laughs> but we're going to spend some time on the rapture. So in First Thessalonians, we will look at uh, some scriptures in verse uh, chapter 4. And this is the clearest description in the Bible uh, that refers to the rapture of the church. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, it says, According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that you who are still alive, you are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For, those, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of an archangel with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's the, the combination of words that, that raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So again, there'll be a group, as I talked about this morning during communion, there'll be a group of people, a generation that will just be caught up together with the Lord uh, when he comes a second time. We'll have to go through the grave. Uh, but when will this happen, and, and can I prepare myself? You're thinking, okay, well, if I know that's going to happen, maybe I need to get some things on, or I need to get my ducks in a row. And so we would look at this, getting your ducks in a row real quick here, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. Holy smokes, that's a big one. And so it says right there very quickly, it says, In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet call, in a twinkling of an eye, this rapture thing will happen. And do you know how fastly your eyes twinkle? Uh, it, four, 14 times in a second. You know, you can do it really fast. And so, um, okay, get ready. Oh, too late, sorry, not ready. You know, like, do you see how quickly that is? So you don't have time. You, you kind of just like kind of plan, oh, hey, in the new year, we'll kind of make this plan and we'll kind of get things. That, no, no, it's going to happen so quickly. So we have to be ready all the time. We have to be ready in all season, all the time. And so what happened when this First Thessalonians was written is that some thought, oh, no, the rapture's happened and we missed the boat. And so... Paul just writes just a little while later. You know, I don't know. There's not an exact time frame. I didn't spend a lot of time. He had to write them back and say, guys, it didn't happen. These are the things that will happen before I come. And so let me show you what those kind of things were. And so we look at here. Before Jesus comes a second time, Paul's re-emphasizing, reminding them that they, he hasn't come yet. And here's what you can expect when I come. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
starting in verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. It hasn't yet. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day, the day the rapture, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed for destruction. So I haven't seen a rebellion or a man of lawlessness and all these kind of things yet. So he hasn't come yet. I'm going to share a couple more stories with you or more scripture with you to explain things that have to happen before he will come. But we know historically some things that cause us to feel like these Thessalonians might. About like, I'm not sure what the Bible says about that. I'm not sure if he's coming yet. Because as a country, as a earth, as a globe, we've gotten away from biblical truth and literacy. I'm almost illiterate. I'm not saying this to judge a church here. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying that in general. And here's the reasons why. And we all know this. Uh, in the 1960s, in the early 60s, that was only 63 years ago, public schools started the day with the Lord's Prayer. You know what hung on the wall? Some of us know that. The Ten Commandments hung on the wall in every class. It was only later on in the 60s that they banned the prayer. And in the 80s, they banned the Ten Commandments from school. So today, the Bible is under clear attack. And we're not general, 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 I'm trying to say the right word, generationally learning and passing on God's word because we're not being taught it anymore, especially in the public system. It's a post-Christian society. It's a post-Bible society. You know, this happens all throughout workplaces. Uh, 2014 was the big one. This woman had on her screensaver in 2014, no weapon formed against me shall prevail. She got court-martialed for that. This is the kind of world that we live in. The last 50 years, we've been falling away from biblical morality, especially in the last 10 years. Things have really come apart here in Canada. There's an abandonment to the Word of God. You know, we're not willing to f uh, follow. We're not willing to obey. We're not willing to recognize the ultimate authority of Scripture. And we base everything off of Scripture. We've moved away from that. So again, that's information. I just wanted to share that with you. What will it look like again <clears throat> when the rapture comes? Let's go to Matthew now. Spend some time in there. If you're thinking in the Gospels, there's got to be something referring to that. So there's a ton in here. Matthew chapter 24. The subheadings in your Bible might say something like this in Matthew 24. It's two stories. Signs of the end of the age. And then the hour and the day is unknown. And there's just chapter 24 is just filled with that. It's great. And then the Lord continues to teach on that now through parables. Just like I shared with you, there's some information. Now let me share a story with you so it makes sense. So we see in chapter 25, we see three parables. Parable of ten virgins, the parable of the talents, and the parable of the, the sheep and the goats. And so let's just look at a couple of those just quickly. So Matthew 25, verse 1, it says, At the time the kingdom of heaven will be like... And then we know the story of the ten virgins. We'll look at that a little bit later. And then it says, after that teaching, that parable, it says in verse 8, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. It says that not even Jesus Christ himself knows. The Lord, God knows, and he will tell Jesus at some point, you're going to go down there and get our people, you know, bring them all up here, and there'll be this rapture time. So we see in these three stories, though, because sometimes we just teach Matthew 25 as parables and we need to learn something through them. And they are to do that. But the reason they're written there, because underlining all of this stuff, every time we get up and somebody preaches at you or you read the Bible, you're just looking for truth. Why was that written? How does that apply to my life? That's what we're looking for. Because otherwise it's, it's information. It's just a book and you're going to read it. But how is it going to apply to our life? So we see this in all three parables. As we saw in verse 1, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like. It's referring to what it will be like when God comes again. In verse 14, the parable of the talents, again, it will be like. It's trying to teach us that when Jesus shows up, this is what it will be like. In verse 31, so the sheep and the goat story, 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory. When Jesus comes in his glory a second time, it will be like this. So he's trying to help us to understand that. So these parables are trying to get us ready. Each one of those parables are trying to get us ready for his return. And so how do we get ready? What kind of things should we do? And unfortunately, some, I'll be really careful around, again, around the world, not us, not locally, but some churches are rejecting the thoughts around that kind of a teaching. Some churches are being divided over things. Some churches don't believe in a literal hell and a literal Satan or devil or whatever you want to say. Some churches are believing in universalism. There's many ways to heaven. There's many ways, and Jesus isn't the only way. These are the kind of things that are being taught, even though it's very, very clear in biblical teaching. I've said this before, and I just think it's a good time to say it again. There is a major denomination where the leader got up and said this. I won't define my lifestyle or my sexuality by the four corners of this book anymore. It's a time for another gospel to be written. That's more up to date for the times that we're living in, and the people applauded. This is the kind of things that we're facing, not only in the public, but in the four walls of churches. And again, not us, anyone in town. I'm not, you know, suggesting anything negative. I'm just, it's information. Much of the church is ready for the return of Christ. I believe there are tons of churches. I believe that this community is ready to go. Lots of great churches in this community. You know, there's good things happening. But there's also some that are falling away. They're rejecting the clear teaching of the Bible. And that's hard to say because we're supposed to be getting ready. We're supposed to be following this, not abandoning this. Not rejecting it. Not moving away from it. We've got to stay true to the truth. It's written there for us. It's clear for us. It's not written like in a way that we can't understand or it's hard to interpret. It's written. It's so clear. Every time you open, and I promise, it will speak to you. It will minister to you. It will show you right or wrong. Whatever you're facing, you think, all the New Year's things come. I've got to make this big decision. Look to the Word of God. It will guide you. That's what it's there for. It's not there for any other reason. It's not there to you know, divide us or, or cause division or cause conflict. It's there to be a blessing to you as we get ready for that day when he shows up again. It's so exciting. I just want to keep preaching that silly, yeah, here we go. It's all these pages I've got to get through. Matthew 25, let's go back there. Let's just spend time on one parable to help us to understand this a little bit, because it's a great story, but it's trying to get us ready again for when he returns. So let's just read it here. So Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, we're going to read quite a chunk of the sheep and the goat story. But it's very important that we understand the reason that story is there. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, so again, this is rapture time. Jesus is going to come, and all the angels with him, that's exciting, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as sheep separates, or as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. I think that's clear as well. We can understand that sheep, good, goats, unclean. You know, sheep, believers, goats, unbelievers. Now he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, those are the sheep, now you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Oh, isn't that exciting, Matthew? Like for those that know the Lord, God has created a place for you and I since the very beginning of creation. And he's just waiting and longing for us to get there. And when that day comes, that will be in a very exciting day. So when we think about, oh, the rapture, the end times, it's scary and bad. It's exciting. It's, you know, that's what we live for. This is the gospel. This is the good news. That's good news. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. I want to go there. No, I like, I, no, I don't like, I love my wife, I love my kids, but that place is out of bounds. This is next level. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came and visited me. And some of us, when we read that, you're thinking, okay, I'm not sure what he means by I. Okay, so let me, then the Lord, obviously, in all his wisdom, let me explain this a bit more to you. Then the righteous will answer him. Those that are the sheep, those of us that are saved and set free, we will answer the Lord and say, 
Lord, I don't remember doing those things. When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And the king will reply, King Jesus, the Lord himself will reply to you. I tell you the truth. Oh, oh yes. We need that truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. So as we wait for the rapture to come, what are we to do? What are we to get in order? Like we're supposed to get our lives in order? We're supposed to worry about, you know, our stuff and, you know, get our, you know, I got to get right and all. I don't say anything about that. It says about focusing on other people. And the Lord came as a servant. The Lord came to serve people. And so when the Lord comes down and, and he looks at us in our lives and thinking, okay, is this a sheep or a goat? And he's going to look at, it's not about doing. Please understand. It's not about like, oh, if I do these things, I'm going to get to heaven. It's not about that. It's about clearly understanding that when you receive Jesus Christ, you were a goat, an unclean, filthy goat, and you're now a sheep. Story done, end of story. You are a sheep. You're in good standing with the Lord. But then the Lord says, what did you do since then? What did you do with all of your time and your energy until I came again? These are the things he's speaking of. Did you go and visit people? Did you clothe people? Did you think about others? That's the whole purpose of that. He covered every base. Like there's not a base that wasn't covered there. You just went out and you looked into the world and you saw that there was hurting people and you loved them. That's what I'm looking for. Like, that's what we're called to do. So we don't just kind of, again, wait around like, oh, hopefully the rapture, hopefully, hopefully I make it. We focus on all of our stuff. Go out. Every day is an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, to love on somebody, to witness to somebody, to not worry about our own stuff, and to just go and serve the world. I don't know what that looks like for each and every one of us. There's no cookie-cutter answer to that. It's broad. Because some of us will be called. I mean, our church up north in Whitehorse, there was a prison, 300-bed prison. You could do up to five years there. If you did a harder crime than that, you got sent to Prince George or somewhere else. So we had prison ministry. We thought, we're going to take that scripture, literally, and we're going to go to that prison, and we're going to share the gospel. We did services there. Well, here in Terrace, there's an overnight uh, jail here, so that would be hard to do ministry there. But what can we do as a church? What can we do as an individual? Again, I don't know what that is. But let God lead you in that. And when you find it and you do those things, then run with it. Isn't that just wonderful to think about? Oh God, you've designed me and you planted me here to meet and love people here in my community. I don't have to go far. We love overseas missions. We support them all over the place. We've got John Ingalls coming in a couple weeks. He's going to share about all the wonderful things that is happening. But there's a mission right here. There's even a mission in the four walls of the church. Because God keeps bringing people here that need to know him. And so I want to encourage you with just, as, let's just be very, I'm just a simple guy, just a black and white kind of simple guy. When somebody comes in the four walls of this church, I want to hear stories like my friend shares with me. He said, I went to a church one time, and before I sat down, 14 people had said hello, shook my hand, loved me, did something. He said, I felt like the celebrity. I thought I was the guest speaker. But I just realized that was just the church. I want our church to be that. I want our church to represent that. And so when we think about, too, as we, oh, we're headed to the new year, you know, 2024. You know, cast a vision, you know, share some ideas of what, what God's up to in our church and that kind of stuff. It's as simple as the truth of his gospel that we go and love strangers, we clothe those that need clothes, we, we witness, we love on, we reach out to everybody that the Lord brings into our path. If we can do those simple things right, I mean, it's the Lord. He does the rest. He, he has complete control and authority over all that, but we have a part to play in that. I pray in Jesus' name that we would take that literally and seriously as a church that we would get out of our comfort zone and just witness and be an example, whatever that looks like. And when the Lord prompts you, it's going to get nervous sometimes. You might feel a little uncomfortable sometimes, but just do it. 
I can say this, the person's not here this morning, so it's good. <laughs> Last night, this is just some truth here, let's be some truthfulness between uh, me and you. Um, I'm, I'm on holidays, and so I've got my time off at home, and so I, I come here late last night as I do every Saturday. I'm getting ready, and I go to the fridge because it's communion. I'm like, oh, my word, there's no communion juice. Not only am I spilling it, we don't even have any juice. And so I'm looking, it's 9.30. I'm like, i got to get to the store. <laughs> you know, floor it over to, I realize there's one store still open. I go to go in, and I, oh, there's this guy here I know. And the Lord just stops me in my tracks. I'm like, I can't go into the store. Because I gotta talk to this guy right now. I just felt like you know the Lord just kind of eh, you know kind of gives you a hook or you know you know pulls you off the stage or wherever you're going. He just kind of puts the brakes on it, gets your attention to somebody. And so and I'm talking to him. I'm like, oh my god, I really need to end this conversation because I need the communion juice, Lord. What are you thinking about this? I don't have time for this, Lord. You gotta get the juice. Gotta get back to church. You know what are you doing here? And I just felt like the Lord was like, you know, just spend this moment right here, right now. And so I did, and you know I was able to get the juice and I able to get back here and we all take communion together. But when that happened, I don't know what that meant. I don't know what that did. I didn't say anything. I didn't lead him in a prayer. But I just know that I just needed to spend a moment with this person. Let's not rush around in life. Let's spend those moments. I want to share with you after we're just closing and some thoughts about how I think we can do that better. Now, there's some things we're going to do as a church, uh, some ministries that we're going to offer that I think we can do that better. And so I want to create some spaces for that. So. Let's just close this time off, though. Uh, let's just close our eyes and, and just uh, spend a moment here. Father, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Lord, we want to be ready in season, and, and we're, especially when we're, we're not in, in our best and when we're out of season. We just want to be ready for the, what you want to do and say each and every moment of every day. Lord, we just want to be obedient to you. We don't need a, a facility. We don't need money. We don't need anything but you. You, Jesus, will lead us and guide us and bring us in those conversations. You, Holy Spirit, that's inside of us will quicken our words and our thoughts. And so thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to worry about you coming. I want to be thinking about rejoicing when you come. I don't want to worry about thoughts of like, oh, I didn't do enough or really wish I would have. I, I want our lives each and every day to go. We put our heads on the pillow and say, yes, Lord. God, I, I tried to do my best today. I tried to represent you the best I could today. And tomorrow's a new day, and if I blew it today, Lord, you're, you're merciful and you're, you're gracious, and you're going you're gonna to be with me tomorrow again. And so, Lord, whatever you want to do today, this week, this coming year, in your church, I pray that it would happen. I pray there would be no hindrances. I pray that the pastoral team, the board, the leadership team would not get in the way of what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen.